All right, we're coming to the end of, of our look at life through the eyes. This. And what we see, am I fading in and out? Did it just drop out? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm the tech guy, and so when I think I hear something, fortunately, when I probably shouldn't speak. So um, Jesus saw a lot of things. But one of the things that he saw, especially as he was on that, that final journey with Simon of Cyrene carrying the cross for him, and as they, they put him on the cross, and as he, he endured the agony of dying, and his ultimate physical death, we see the culmination of God's purpose and God's plan for what Jesus had intended. Because when he looked out, as he walked and as he was, he was taking that, those final steps to being nailed to the cross and when he was hanging on the cross, he saw basically the life from humanity's standpoint, from human point of view. So what I want to do this morning is I want us to look at six things ever so briefly. I'm going to set my watch for two hours. <laughs> Kidding. This clock is fast. This but I want us to see in Scripture what Jesus saw. Because when we look out, out at our world, we really essentially see exactly what Jesus saw. Nothing's changed as far as humanity is concerned. There's always going to be the, the lost. There's always going to be the criminal. There's always going to be the no dolls. There's always going to be the no dolls searching that are seeking for something, because God put in each and every one of us an innate need for him. And the problem is, is that we get so caught up in, in other things that we begin to feel, feel, ugh, fill that need with stuff, or with people, or emotions, or wanting and dislikes, politics, money, you, you name it, we, we begin to fill that void that God put in each and every one of us with something other than what we need so desperately. And as Christians, we can never supplant what Jesus has provided for us, his Holy Spirit, but we can quench the Holy Spirit, we can stifle the Holy Spirit. And so I want us to begin looking this morning in Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 26, and I want to walk us through Jesus' last steps to his death. And I want to point out six things that should be in our purview because they were in his. So let me begin in verse 26 of Luke chapter 23. When they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country and placed the, on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. And following him was a large crowd of, of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us in the hill, and, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also, who were criminals, were being led away to be put to death with Jesus. When they came to the place called the skull, where they crucified him, and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among them. And the people stood by looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying he saved others. Let him save himself. If this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of kings, save yourself. Now there was all of him, this 
is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And indeed, we are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. It was now the sixth hour, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour, because the sun was obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two out with a loud voice said father into your hands I commit my spirit having said this he breathed his last breath now when the centurion saw what had happened he began praising God saying certainly this man was innocent and all the crowds who came together for the spectacle when they observed what had happened began to return beating their breasts and all and all his acquaintances and the women who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance, seeing these things. Father, may you speak through your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The first thing Jesus saw, he saw the crowd. He saw the, these guys that, that, that were here for, as Scripture says, the spectacle. The one that professed to be the Son of God, the Messiah, the Chosen One, the Coming One, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And so he saw this crowd, this needy crowd that despised him. He saw the hate. He saw the, the disappointment. He saw them as they really were. Needy for him. Because Jesus, as, he, as he's motivated, he's motiv motivated first by the plan that God in three persons decided was the plan. And this plan was to reach a lost and godless world who had been so wrapped up in religion and the laws and the rules creating their own to, to put on top of those Ten Commandments that, that God had, had put forth and all of the, the, the restrictions and, and behavioral. He saw how religion had, had corrupted the plan of God. But we can never get rid of God's plan. And so Jesus was always the plan. He was always the Father's purpose. As they had their meeting, however they had it, God, in three persons, determined that the Son of God would be the one who would come in the flesh and would suffer a humili humiliating death so that the needy... You want me to just switch mics? I start again <laughs> so Jesus saw part of why he came see because he came for you and me he came for the soldiers that were mo mocking him he came for for the chief priest and 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 all the scribes and all the Pharisees that that despised him that thought he'd come to ruin their good thing and as Jesus was taking that journey to the cross, and as he hung on the cross, that was part of his plan. For those that, that had no need for what God was doing because they, they liked their life, they liked their religion, they liked their beliefs, he came so that they could have an opportunity, have the chance to truly know God in the way that God wants to be known. See, because God doesn't want to be known just as the author and the perfecter of this book and our faith. He wants to be known as, as Abba, Father, our Daddy. 
someone who loves and who cherishes and nourishes us. And Jesus was that price so that we could know God as God wanted to be known. But it's not just the righteous, because let's be brutally honest, we're only righteous because Jesus has said we're righteous. If we were all left to our own accord, we'd be living hell on earth. And yet Jesus said, you don't have to do that. And so when Jesus looks out and he sees Simon carrying that cross and he sees those women of mourning, those were prof probably professional mourners that just waited for someone to be crucified or someone to be, to, to be buried or, or die so that they could weep and mourn and, and howl and wail and, and, and just get into the groove, so to speak. And so Jesus came for the needy. He came for, for the needy unbelievers the needy crowd, but he also came for the soldiers. He came to the ones that were going to ultimately crucify him. But he also came, and these, this is a big part of this section, is he came for those two that were hanging on the side of him, one on the, his left and one on his right. Let me just re read that again. Verse 32, the, Two also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. And then we come over to verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling, ab hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and for us. And the other said, What in the world are you saying, buddy? Don't you see? He is Christ. He's the Lord. You deserve this. I deserve this. He doesn't deserve this. And then he says those, those words, Lord, remember me. And Jesus said, I haven't forgotten you. I could never forget you. For today, when you breathe your last breath, you'll be with me in paradise. Now, if you go back and you look at, at Matthew and you look at Luke, this one that professed Jesus in, in Luke's account was also mocking to begin with. So something miraculous happened. He recognized his need. And that's why Jesus came. So that we could recognize that we are not self-sufficient. That he provides for us. Because if he didn't grow these trees, and if he didn't put this water in this land, in this air, well, we wouldn't exist. He provides for all things. And so he saw the needy criminal, and he goes, you know, I see that repentance. I see that recognition. And so the one on his right ended up being the first. Professor, not teacher professor of faith in Jesus, understanding the true picture. Because he was going to die right alongside Jesus. And in that moment, he could have continued to curse and to mock, and yet he didn't, because somewhere, somehow God and his truth reached his need. And that's what he wants. He wants his, his results to reach our needs so that, so that we don't depend on what we think we know and on what we see. Because if you were in the crowd that, that day, an agitator named Jesus, a liar named Jesus, a false prophet named Jesus was being crucified for sedition against Rome and Jerusalem and the Old Testament. If you were just a bystander, if you were just a criminal, and all you did was live life for yourself, you would have thought Jesus was getting what he deserved. How dare he supplant the Old Testament teachings? And yet Jesus was being the author of, uh, of, of the New Covenant, of the New Testament. It's no wonder the New Testament begins with the Gospels. Because it's the story of Jesus coming to fulfill the, the purpose and the plan of God. 
so that we don't have to bring, bring goats and beef and herbs and, and wine and, and whatever he demands. Jesus said, I am the price. I paid the price and would pay the price in full. But notice that he, he dealt with the crowd first. He dealt with the world first. And then he dealt with the criminals. But then he began to deal with just common people, those that weren't there just for the spectacle he addressed. He addressed the world. He addressed the worker. He, he addressed the, the soldier, the centurions. He addressed the guy that was carrying the cross on his back. He addressed the unbeliever. Those that might, might think they know God, might have always done everything right religiously, but he knew that that wasn't enough. That we can't be good enough by following all the rules and all the regulations. That God is a God of forgiveness. God is a God of, of restitution, of God of, of, of restoration. And so Jesus was the fulfillment so that we would never have to sacrifice to him like they did in the past. That he was the ultimate sacrifice that God desired and God demanded. So he saw the unbelievers. Let me read this again. And the people stood by looking on. And even the rulers were uh, sneering at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If this is the Christ of God, his, so his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him and offering him sour wine, saying, if you are the king of, of the Jews, why don't you save yourself? Almost every person has their own idea of who Jesus is. Do you know that? We all do. I believe he is the Christ, the son of the living God, like we talked about a couple weeks ago. That he is the price for my salvation. He's the price for, for the salvation of all who would believe. And so he looks at the needy crowd, the needy unbelievers, the needy criminals, and he says, I, I'm enough. I'm enough. I am the price. It's not, it's not your cow. It's not your grain offering. I'm paying the price for you. And just imagine what must have been going through Jesus' mind. Knowing that he was going to die a human death, we can never take that away from him. He suffered and he died. But he did that willingly. Romans says that hardly anybody will ever do that. Really, nobody would do, would do that. No innocent person. And yet Jesus, the most innocent of all, said, I will give my life for you. How cool is that? Man, I look in the mirror and I go, man, I, d I don't deserve this. Jesus, I just did this, and yet when I look in the mirror, I know how far I can fall, and yet you love me anyway. You care for me anyway. As the song said, you looked beyond my faults, and you saw my need. And he meets that need every single day because the need is met in a relationship with him, a personal relationship with him. I mean, you don't just walk up to a stranger and go, hi, daddy. Do you? Well, I hope not. Surprise? No. Or he says we're heirs and joint heirs with him. He says we're sons, we're kids, we're children. We're part of God's family. The moment we profess faith in Christ and repent of our sins and ask him to come and save us and give us new life. 
And that changes everything. And yet he left us in a world where we can pretty much do whatever we want to do. And he says, just don't do it. Don't just follow your heart. Don't just follow your whims. Don't just follow your, your mind. Follow the heart that I gave you. Don't push it aside. Don't stifle my Holy Spirit. Don't quench my Holy Spirit. Because he's going to guide you through life. And you know what is right and you know what is wrong. Don't be the one that chases after unrighteousness. He said, because you don't have to do that anymore. Just as we said from the beginning of this, just follow me, he says. Just follow me. Let's look at verse 44. It was now the, about the sixth hour and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour because the sun was obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he died. He breathed his last breath. Jesus saw the Father. Even if he didn't physically see it, he knew the Father had his back. He knew that God was God, because he was God, but he also put all, all, all of his well-being into the hands of the Father. Scripture says he only did what the Father led him to do. So he lived his life pleasing the Father. And so in the end, he said, Father, into your hands I commit myself. I commit my spirit because he saw that what the plan was had been completed in him. And that's what he wants us to see is that it's completed in him. And that we basically, when we come to the saving knowledge of who Jesus is, we, we do what Jesus said. Into your hands, I commit my spirit. I commit myself. God, I give you all that I am, all that I'll ever be. I place myself in your hands. I trust that you know the way. And you know he does know the way because he made the way. And so part of what Jesus is, is accomplishing here is he's, he's sh showing everybody who, who believes, everybody who would believe, everyone who would ever read this book, that God is trustworthy. Just look at me, Jesus says, in my final earthly moments before my glorified body, I put my fate, if you believe in fate, in the hands of the Father in the hands of God, because I trust knowing that he has made a way. That's part of the reason in, in Acts they call this the way, the way of Jesus, because the Father put an exclamation point on Jesus saying, he's the way. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me or through me. So even way before this happened, Jesus said, I am the pathway to God. Do you believe that? We live in a dying world where, you know, there's mockers and there's revilers and those that, that scorn and those that that belittle not just God, but those of us who believe in God. Jesus faced the exact same thing, but at a much, much more volatile level than we ever will. I mean, we're in the United States for Pete's sake. There are people in China and North Korea who are believers who are losing their lives for their faith. And we get bent out of shape when somebody passes a law that we think limits us in our speech or limits us in this or that because we live in America and we're privileged. Praise God. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. But at the same time, what Jesus shows us is, is, is that even the lawmakers are going to hate you. Don't put your faith in the law. Don't you put your faith in what man has done. Put faith in what I have done. Because the law will always turn against you. The rules will always have a loophole. There's always going to be people involved that don't 
know and don't love Jesus. So don't put your faith in the political system. Put your faith in Jesus. Don't lean to the right. Don't lean to the left. Stand in the center where he's at. I mean, he said, Paul says, there's a very, very narrow road. Okay? And if you step off even one foot on either side, you're not on the road anymore. If you're leaning left, Put your foot back in the center. If you're leaning right, put your foot back in the center. Because Republican, Libertarian, Democrat, Communist, whatever, whatever's out there, it is never the right pathway. Doesn't mean it's not part of our life. But he says, you stand firm in me. That's what Jesus accomplished here. He said, you don't have to lean so far this way or lean so far this way. Why don't you stand here, follow me, and I'll lead you down that narrow path without getting sucked in to all of this minutia, all of this stuff that's going to send a dying world to hell. Jesus paid the price so that we could know salvation, forgiveness, restoration, reconciliation, so that we could walk faithfully and not always be looking left, not always be looking right, not always looking behind us, but always looking forward for what he's got in store. Man, it's really easy to get derailed. It's really easy to jump ship. But the guy that, that was thrown overboard, remember him? Jonah. It took him time in a fish's belly and all that wonderful decor before he finally got it, that God's bigger than the waves, than the ship, and even the big old fish that was big enough to swallow him and not kill him. Because he had stepped off course because he hated the Ninevites. God, why would you want me to go and see these, these criminals, these unbelievers, these, these pagans, this crowd? God, you wouldn't, yeah, you did. You did send me there, didn't you? And you told me to simply follow, follow your directions. And so it took him being burped up back on the beach to finally realize God's bigger than I am. And I said I was going to follow his plan, so I guess I better. One last thing. In verses 48 and 49, Jesus saw the results. He always sees from the beginning to the end. And in verse 48, Luke writes, And all the crowds who came together for this spectacle, when they observed what had happened, began to return, beating their breasts, convicted. And all his acquaintances and the women who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance saying these things. What did they see? What did they see? Jesus is dead. He's physically dead. Breathed his last breath. So what did they see that caused them? What did they hear that caused them to beat their breasts? Not just in mourning. That's not really what this is talking about. This is talking about a, 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 a turning, a repentance, a, a changing of, of direction. Well, let's just back up just a couple other verses. Just one verse, verse 47. Now, when the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. They saw the power of God. All of them saw the power of God. A, a man that's going to the cross who's dying and says, Father, forgive them for they don't have a clue what they're doing. Father, into, into your hands, I, I, I commit my spirit. Father, forgive them, for they don't have a clue what's going on. But in those final two verses, they began to get a clue as to who Jesus was. They began to recognize and realize, and they would in the... In the coming days and, and weeks, they would, they would see, some of them would see Jesus 
arisen, sharing his life until he ascends into heaven. But Jesus saw the end. He knew the end game. He knew what exclamation point had to be there. And it was him giving everything to the purpose and plan of the Father. And it says he breathed his last breath. And all of a sudden, realization began to come upon people. And soon the Holy Spirit would come, come in a way he'd never come before, and he'd fill those believers' hearts with himself. And the Peters and the Pauls that we talked about, and the disciples and the apostles, their whole existence would change because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Because he met the needy right where they were. He does the same thing today. He says, if you don't know me, if you don't love me, give me a chance. That's part of what we get to do as Christians. We get to present him in such a way that isn't left-leaning, isn't right-leaning, isn't backward-looking, that is forward-looking, saying, this is who God is. This is who Christ is. This is what he's done for me. You know, he gave us all a testimony. I've heard some incredible testimonies of people that were just the scourge of the earth, the scum of the earth that God got a hold of, and, and he ripped their lives apart, and he put them back together, and they're, they're brand new people. And for years and for, and for decades, the old was passed away, and behold, everything had become new. And there's some that, you know, never drank, never smoked, never cussed, and never did anything wrong, but just didn't know Jesus. And for those people, hallelujah, you didn't have as far to go. Who said, you know, I, life is good, but, you know, this guy, Jesus, I think he can change my life. Charles Green told me he could change his, he could change my life. Dan Calvert said, said, he changed his life. Well, maybe he can change mine too. Maybe he'll, he'll save me too. Maybe he'll give me purpose. Maybe he'll give me meaning. That's what he accomplished on the cross. Was he met the need of everything. Of all things, nothing that was needy was left out of God's plan. And so he says, come to me, all who are weary, and I'll give you rest for your soul, for your doubts, for your fears. But it takes us coming to him. And even as, as followers of Christ, it's staying on that narrow path. It's staying in that relationship. It's not letting the world and all of its pressures uh, destroy you, discourage you, so that we can walk in faith and victory because there's victory in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the stories that you put in the Bible. God, how you mentioned Simon, how you mentioned the sin territory, and how you mentioned those two criminals that hung on either side of Jesus. And how, God, you used that moment in history to reshape everything. And that you love us and that you care for us. And that you desire for us to know you in a personal and intimate way. That you see, you see us. And you know us exactly for who we are. So God, may we come to you. May we lay our burdens at the feet of our Savior. And may we allow you to restore us. To give us hope, to give us joy, to give us peace. To give us purpose. That even, even when it seems as if there's no hope and that all is lost, that that can never be the case. That can never be the case in you because you are the all-sufficient God of creation, of salvation, of all things. 
So, God, this morning I put myself in your hands. I put this body in your hands. All those that, that are listening that have been with us this morning, God, I, I just I pray, God, that you would meet them where they are and that you draw them to yourself. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll be up here afterwards, and we're going to go have a baptism. So Alicia, if you'd head back, um, uh, we're going to sing our song, and I'm going to be a quick change artist, and I'm going to get changed. Uh, we actually have a bathtub fe filling, feeling water. That's doesn't quite make sense, but it's it's like a bathtub. Usually, it's like a lake in Alaska. But Alicia, it's warm. We're not bringing soap. But we're going to sing our song. George is going to pray. And then hopefully I'll be ready by that time. Okay? Are we good? Okay. Father, thank you for another day to worship you and just honor you with our our words and our singing and our just our presence here today. And, and may we always be aware that you're constantly looking out for our needs and that if someone doesn't know you, they don't need to go far. They just need to turn around and you'll be there willing to, to meet them where they are. We ask that you bless this wonderful time of baptism today that, that it will inspire us to just be even that more faithful in our walk with you. In your name we pray. Amen. God, again, I come before your throne. God, I ask that you would, Father, reveal yourself in a very real way to each and every one of us this morning and this afternoon. God, that we would know that we've been in your house, that we've been surrounded by your children, that your spirit indwells those who believe. And God, that we have hope a hope that comes through Christ, that we can have joy, that, that, that the cares of this world, the pressures of this world, they do not have to dis destroy us and discourage us, but that in you we find purpose, that we find love, that we find hope and happiness and joy. Thank you for loving us, God. Thank you, Jesus, for coming and giving your life for all of us. May you keep us. May we allow you to keep us. And may we walk with you every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful afternoon. Lord bless you. Go ahead and put that down.